Hello, this is Harker Bean, and today we are going to be reading in SCP-6500, and we are going to be finishing The Path of the Thief. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Now let's get right back to this. Vines. Veins, actually. A massive tangle of them. And as his flashlight found the corners of other objects, he knows that it must have been something like a ball of these things. Twisted together with taut, long cords of them, keeping the things suspended in whatever vast chamber it must have been in the middle of. And he was on top of it, with a broken hip. Oh my god, I'm an idiot. The realization was almost comforting, and he chuckled a soundless chuckle. When I, I get out of here, this is going to be a hilarious story. I did everything wrong and hurt, hurt myself really badly. Didn't learn shit and wasted time and resources. This is definitely one of my worst moments. And it's gonna be fucking funny. He nodded to himself, half smiling and half wincing at the pain. Tony, I think we're just gonna going to go through with it. It seems things went poorly, and we aren't comfortable with the mission continuing while we have no idea what's going on. Stay put for 30 minutes. Well, I can do that, he thought. His back felt red and cold. He must have made some some of the vines burst when he fell full force into them. But cold? Tony lifted his right hand out of the liquid and pointed the flash at it. His left steps with his left. The substance, which he assumed to be blood, was cold. Cold, brown, and thin. The consistency closer to muddy water than blood. He put his hands back down. There's no point in moving. And plus, moving really fucking and hurt his hips, so he was just going to sit. It's so. God, it was cold. Tony had underestimated just how cold space was. It made sense in retrospect. Shouldn't you have remembered? It's like there was so much he was supposed to remember. Like diving in the bay or his first exploration as a D class. The years had slowly taken that from him. He didn't know by what mechanism. He remembered he was capable of surviving in space. For some reason, he had to remember how cold it was. He shook his head. He'd learned to. Wait a second. No, yeah, that was right. Like a frog in boiling water. He hadn't noticed that the liquid was crawling up on him. Maybe the same numbing had, that had happened around his hips had made, has made it all just a, a, a special type of numb. But he was definitely sinking. Well, he thought, that can't be good. He tried to put himself on his elbows to get at least his upper body out of the pool, but when he put a pressure on his arms simply slipped between in, into his veins, his veins, and he felt them tighten around him. Of course they can move. God fucking damn it. The liquid swallowed the flashlight. Now only a, a dim brown glow in the pool. And then it began to creep up to his chest, which he was using in all his course right to desperately keep above the stuff. He tried to yank his arm out from under the vines, but at the motion his hip pierced with a pain so strong that he sent back into a lying position to try and soothe it, placing his left eye halfway under the gunk. He didn't need to breathe, but he was doing so instinctually. And he at once inhaled a mouthful of brown, muddy blood, which made him cough, hack, wheeze, thrashing only when he could reason and fasten an unbelievable pain in his hip. More often than not, returning in, in after to the pool, which was gaining on him, rising on him, coming up and burning his nose in his nose, making him gasp for an air that didn't exist, flopping like a f fish, splashing the low liquid. And then, eventually, he was submerged. Ironically, he saw more here than he had before. The flashlight bounced around the liquid, and he was surrounded not by blackness, but by a rotting fecal brown, which tasted like iron and felt like, like nothing he had felt before. Despite looking like, like the same consistency throughout, moving himself, he felt as if some parts were thicker than others, like the liquid folded in on itself, if such a thing were at all possible. He tried to hold his breath for as long as he could. It occurred to him, oh god, did it occur to him to add, while he would survive, every breath of this stuff hurt. He didn't require oxygen, but his lungs still re 
He ducked to the liquid as if he were well and truly drowning. He twisted, he writhed, floating into stuff, his hip hurt less with the spasms. Floating. The vine the vein slowly twisted off of his right arm and now he was free again. Free. He fled before finding a purpose. Grab having the flashlight immediately swimming upwards, using only his arms so that his hips wouldn't ruin his attempts. He could tell he was make he couldn't tell if he was making progress. Everything looked the same. He stopped swimming for just one second to see if he sank. And he did. With a sense of direction, he strove upwards. Finding the instinct to breathe, continuously reminding himself that he didn't need to do that. That he could hold his breath forever. His progress was slow. The thought of uh, not having any points of reference. But he was making it. Upward and upward. The pool seeming so much deeper than it was. Then he bumped into something. He waved the flashlight and found that the that his exit was blocked. Blocked by those veins. He tried to find his knight, but quickly realized his backpack had disappeared at some point. It must have either been floating somewhere or was left up top when he was while he was swallowed. He fought for an idea, and before he could assess whether it was a good one or not, he decided to plunge his arm into the veins. He wiggled his hand and forearm, trying to push through the tangled mass, figuring out how thick the thing was, whether or not he could even cut through it in the first place, or maybe to see if he could just push through. He made some progress. With much of such exertion, he, he felt a deep, primal desire to breathe in, in with it, which of course he nearly gave in to before remembering not to. Constantly at war with his impulses, despite not used to the idea of holding it in. Then he saw it. His arm, that is. It was up to the elbow Owen in the veins, and he was feeling the sudden cold from the vacuum of space. On the other side, and he looked to his bicep and reeled. It was rattling. The skin looked like wet, torn paper drifting into stagnant brown liquid, feeling cloudy, cottony, outpouring of fat and pus and blood from underneath. Finally, his body and then he involuntarily gasped, but it didn't hurt. In this very same spasm, his left hand had lost hold of the flashlight, which drifted it gently away, giving any chance he had of vision. That shock of having to look at his own desiccated figure, Tony could calm down. Okay, he thought, I'm dying. He died before. This wasn't particularly new to him. I'm being digested by this fluid. It makes sense now. It must have been a numbing agent, which is why I didn't feel it crawling up on me. I didn't feel it eating my arm, and now my lungs, lungs don't hurt when I breathe it. It was in Tony's eyes. It's relieving, finding there was no uncertainty, and the thing was killing him was kind enough to make it not. If not uh, quick, at least painless. He figured that as soon as it reached his brain, in or his heart, he, would be, he was done for it. With that, he let himself read, even if it was a, his poison. I up to the Evelyn veins, reading blood, being digested. This is probably a typical way for a D-class to go, Tony thought. And so, he stopped struggling. He simply floated. He felt barely anything. The flashlight continued to sink, and soon its light was gone completely. From a dark brown to utter blackness. At some point in the process, all that was left was sound. Tony could hear the sloshing of the, the stuff. The muscles rumbling in his own ears. His own heartbeat. But then, that was suddenly gone too. It must have... I've made it to his ears, he thought. No feeling, no sight, no sound. This is the most conscious I've ever been while I'm completely and utterly dead. He was a smirked, but he was too numb to tell. His blackness and his thoughts. And then there was... Nothing. A mere pinprick of nothing. As wide as the universe. And the universe was small. A single dimension, a single point. Containing all that was... All that ever was and will be of nothing and the possibilities therein, which in turn exploded into light, into matter, cascading, expanding, fighting against the point, becoming lines and then shapes and then prisms, dimensions upon dimensions, freighting and birthing and being, 
and suddenly there were stars, and there were planets, and there were solids and liquids and gases and plasmas filling the universe edge to edge. And the universe was big. It was massive. And it was dark. Tony flowed in a viscous void, some parts thicker than others, like space folded in on itself. If such a thing were at all possible, he tried to scream, to call out, but all that came and out of him were bubbles. Bubbles of cosmos that flowed out of him and popped into nebulae and debris. All he could do was watch. Watch as the screaming created patterns. Patterns too vast to comprehend and too small to even notice. Screaming creating patterns. Patterns screamers. Spiraling, swirling galaxies made of spiraling, swirling in solar systems. Made of spiraling, swirling moons, made of spiraling, swirling life. Earth! Tony stopped his shouting as he began to recognize a ball of rock and water. His consciousness out of all the universe is honing in on something familiar. This germ, this speck of, of importance he'd identified. To sip its primordial soup. Time nearly stopped so he, he could gaze upon its opulence. The young thing watching its moon be made, watching asteroids peck its cheeks. But didn't stop. A whirlwind of history passed Tony by. He saw it all, all. He saw the ice ages. He saw the dinosaurs come and go. He saw spiders first develop. His scarab ran and felt it out of order because on a other time scale, really, he doesn't and everything happened at once. What separated Tuesdays from the Sundays? December is from of September's, years from decades, from centuries, from millennia, one eclipse from the next, one species from its neighbor. Now we're from Jesus, from Sakamoto, gods from mortals, Tony from anything. And so, like an apple, Earth was gone. All of a sudden, gone. Humanity, gone. Tony felt his own atoms lose integrity. Felt dark matter itself decay from nothing to ancestors to progeny to nothing. Lights went out. The universe shrunk back into a pinprick from something to nothing. The way of everything. Tony, our remote determination isn't working. Are you still there? Logan RCO is beside from a computer in the lab. A small crowd of doctors, researchers, and supervisors were at his back. Watching just over his shoulders at one of the camera feeds. It showcased a very eventful well, that had failed. Candles and circles and all kinds of sigils that weren't. And I see it was there to know anything about. Logan pushed the mic out of his face. It says his communicator is so available, but we're getting nothing from it. He might be dead. And he might be alive, someone said Ed from behind him. The ritual still summons dead bodies. Something else must be interfering. So you're saying the ritual, what, rejected him? It's a possibility. Logan rubbed a hand across his forehead. Okay, well, what are our options? Send someone else? I think... I think the E11424 excursion has proven the place too dangerous to send an MTF in. We need another reconnaissance mission. Consider that the place might be too dangerous for a reconnaissance mission, Logan shot back. You remember what happened to the drones? Logan, for the first time, fully turned around to view his critics as he thought of them. We know it responds to inorganic matter. Maybe what the 11424 showed us is that it responds to organic matter just differently. It's a possibility. Logan slowly shook his head and asked, Why do we have to keep him in the dark? Don't ask stupid questions, Dr. Arcio. He turned back around in his chair. Fine, we'll give another one. We can send him through in another three hours. Good. Stop shuffling of feet and his small crap out this first. Logan let out a long, overdone sigh. He did right afterwards, too, just to really get out that energy. God, he thought. Just. God. He 
You move the ma Ike back to his face in a moment of self indulgence. I know you're probably dead, but come on, being on the other side of this line sucks too. Tony stared at the communicator as it rattled on. For just on a time crunch is all, Logan Mutton's muddied little voice came through. Thought we could make at least some progress to get the day. And it looks like, like that isn't going to happen. And the off chance you're alive, well, that kind of sucks too. He pinched a tiny, e e tiny speaker between two fingers and just stared at it. Anyways, sayonara. We'll talk later, I guess. And then the transmission stopped. Tony shrugged and what little remained of his shoulders and cracked a smile. An awful, cheekless smile. First he'd ever had the pleasure of noticing quite literally reached from ear to ear. He slid the speaker down and into the palm of his hand, closed his ordering fingers over it and pressed. He opened his palm and were up the remainder of his wet slot and skin and, and sticking between his hand and his fingers, stretching into stringy sinews and then snapping. The speaker was gone. There before had metal so hastily oxidized and bent, dented, crumpled and crumbled. He rubbed its remains with his finger before turning his head over and letting it fall to the ground. He stepped on the mic, transmitter, and their associated tangle of wires. <sighs> and once he pulled his foot away, and that said it rode them completely. Time had its way with them before his very eyes. He took a deep breath of nothing. Eyes wide open because he no longer had lids to close over them. Nor a them to close lids over. Sorry about that, he grumbled. There's no air in space, but even there, if there were, his throat now open in the, thro in the front still wouldn't support a word he said. In spite of this, he was heard. Now back to what's relevant. Who are you? Tony leveled the question at the darkness. The yawning, putrid darkness which beckoned before him, pierced by... I know flashlight, yet seen like no other. Swiftly, in response to his question, it began to open. The red bricks by his feet parted, cracked, and disintegrated. When the ground was gone, Tony floated, and by some unseen force, he was pulled. Dauntless, Tony faced the darkness. No trace of fear in his boiled face. He skipped out of nostrils, his oozing sockets, and as the dark opened up, he began to see. To see a being, an entity, first a silhouette, rising from the blackness like a swimmer breaches the surface, pulling from the blackness like a trapped elephant struggling through a tar. And once that agent of sense poured off of its skin enough that Tony could truly see it, its hideous continents and completely overtook his attention. The, charisp the carapace was almost human. Nearly. Unsettlingly close. It looked like a skull, layered with skin, yet without the aid of muscles. Skin, which itself looked like layers of dry, irritated, tumorous growths, with clearly visible folds, scraping, ings, flakes, and small punctures where pus, blood, and, not, and a disgusting fecal brown fluid poured out. Its sockets were not empty, yet they weren't filled with eyes. They seemed to cry mulch, dirt, like dug-up graves spilling out. And beyond that, at Earth, lay that same Stygian darkness. Tony thought you could make out something there. Something disconnecting, like the universe as was known in entry beyond that black. That within lay a decay so strong, it turned matter not simply into the dirt, but into nothing. I am rot. Its voice hissed and bubbled and popped like corpses gas. His forces in their way through blood and flesh. That answer is surprisingly little. I am decay. I am that which breaks. I am that which tears asunder. I am the slow return of everything to nothing. I am fester. I am wither. I am entropy. I am death. And I am dying. Tony nodded slowly, watching as its mouth didn't even move. Its teeth so big that Tony could fit in the gaps between them. Okay, that makes more sense. Who are you? Tony Grace is one of functioning eyebrow. Me? Honestly, just some guy. 
I walked in here. Name's Tony Marquez. Nice to meet you. You are not Tony Marquez. What? The face grew closer, and with the closing of distance, Tony saw a lumpy green-brown substance spread from the being's nostrils and trailed down towards the upper lip. You only think you are. Cut the cryptic bullshit and explain yourself. The real Tony Marquez died in a diving accident, and Jacob's well. That sinkhole with all the water in it? It was a pipe dream. I never learned how to dive. You bear his dreams, but you are not he. I worked on his flesh over a century ago. His eyes fed the fish before his body was recovered. What remains of him has suffused into earth. You are not Tony Marquez. Tony's cheeks twitched where there were tendons to support such twitching. Why are you telling me this? I see great potential in you. Potential? Potential of what? Potential to rot. From behind rot rose figures it was like the darkness, like dead figures from the darkness, like dead fish rising to the top of a tank, silently floating forward. In each, Tony saw the temple. They were the remains of the old man, except there were many. The old men and the human shapes were merely gateways filled with stars and stunning cold. And in their chests were visages of this place, this temple of rot, this lacerated heart that pumped it blood into nothingness. My acolytes are fulfilling their final purpose. They are decaying beyond the point of use. And their highest of honors, they have come here to die. Why? Why are they dying? Rot only coughed. A sick, wet cough accompanied by that hissing, bubbling background to its voice, loud and thought itself. In time, it responded, We are all dying. What do you mean? Why did you spare me? Once you knew your fate, you became one with it. You did not fight the inevitable. You respected my creation with your own, own destruction. For that, I rewarded you with truth, and you accepted it. The fate of everything. The return to nothing. For that, I saw great potential. Within you, I see death. I see an eternal cycle of life and decay. I see your own memories failing you. I see your soul wear down with time. All you know is to die and be reborn and die again. For that, I extend to you an offer. I give you a chance to take my place. What? Fuck, what? No, why? I am dying. The dark display at once, all of it, and from beneath it rose the veins. Millions of miles of tangled veins, those scabbed at leaves preferring its surface. Burst. Some burst in spilling liquid. Some jumping like live wires. Some collapsed, some with clogs. Often wound up into a humanoid mass and made of the body of this being, of rot. His putrescent head floated, disconnected from the torso and appendages. I once believed I would uh, survive to see the end of all things, the return to nothing which I s oh seek. I believed I would bring it to fruition myself. A hand, the size of a house made of those same twisted arteries, plunged itself into the tangled mass as of Rut's chest. It seems I will not live to see such a fate. Why? What's going on? Such things are beyond my knowledge. But I see a shift in reality. A smell, I smell rot I could never imagine to be so fast. The entropy is accelerating at a rate I had not thought possible. It is beautiful. I and my acolytes are proud to be victims to such power. The hands ends unraveled from its chest. 
and with the retraction in came an outpouring of the oily brown fluid like a dam coming apart. It spewed from Rot's chest and coated in its waist and legs. The hand extended it towards Tony. It as that it, it seemed to shrink, so that once it was within reach, it was a proportion Tony might expect from another human being. And its palm was a heart. Rod's filling veins began to lose a bright red hue, browning before Tony's lack of eyes. Take it. Tony extended his own amalgamation of fat, muscle, and bone, and Rod gently placed it being higher into its cradle, with as much care as the exchange of a baby animal. Why? What is it? With every beat of my heart, the universe moves closer to where it's the zenith of its demise. I may die, but I fear what may happen in my absence. With my essence in others' hands, I will not fade so easily. How can you die? What? What can possibly kill something as powerful as yourself? Spy began to collapse, to shrivel, its veins wrinkle and squirm like cooked worms. A tumorous skin began to melt from its head and revealed a clean white bone underneath. I am decay. I am that which breaks. I am that which tears asunder. I am the slow return of everything to nothing. I am fester. I am wither. I am entropy. I am death. And I am dying. If I were not mortal, I would be false. What am I supposed to do with this? What's going to happen? Even it, and its skull began to crack and turn into dust and dirt. The outlines of his disciples fled space and stars into the darkness, filling the void with a sudden cold that bit it at Tony's exposed entrails. Rot fell into itself, imploding like a corpse being thrown into a warm hole or grave, buried by an unseen undertaker with heaps of cosmo and dark matter. And then Tony felt a stabbing pain in his chest. And then Tony felt it. He looked down to see the heart's extended artery stabbing into his open chest cavity, excising his own moldy heart like a ruptured appendix. Tony screamed as, as Rot made its way toward the center of his being. And no longer was there anyone to hear him. Fuck! I see a matter under his breath. The camera pointed at the old man's corpse, the room where SCP-106 was decided. The room that was so recently abandoned to make way for or the 11424's excursion. There in the middle of it, Isa wrestled his radio from the table and turned it into the frequency of Psych Command and said, Eki Pro call now! Brief pause as they checked his credentials and then 10 4. Before they had confirmed, however, Logan Arcio was already running from his chair and towards the, the exit. The wheeled fl thing flying into the desk. Co workers and researchers were alarmed by his alarm, their eyes tracing his path back to the desk, seeing the camera feed and instantly entering a similar state of single minded panic. The wasp's nest had uh, and kicked. The stairs were flooded with people. But use of training meant that everyone took the sides to their left, so that upwards and downwards flood did not interrupt one another. Stations were ringing a uh, and two, as was always the case. When across the speakers came the siren, Eki Protocol, retreat and takes shelter. Some, suddenly, everybody who wasn't already in the know tense and direction shifted on a dime. There was mild chaos as people tried to push past each other towards what was now the correct left side to be on. But soon the flow was back on track. Even only with an orange scent to everything, his lights began to shine in the hallways. Logan made his way down the stairs, saw armed guards at one set of doors, putting hands to their ears as they got messages, messages through their earpieces. They soon departed, heading left towards the nearest armory, sure to arm themselves appropriately. Logan nodded to himself. Good, they spot him on the camera. While most people retreated either towards the exit or for the personnel who needed to remain in towards safe rooms, bunkers, security stations, and so on, Arcio headed straight towards SCP-106's containment chamber. Arcio followed the flow of traffic down this hallway towards his room, 
crowd people thinning as he got further and further from safety. What people remained became majorly composed of men with guns. Soon he locked, looked out very out of place. One such man with a gun approached him, bearing a badge of proof he caught some of the shots. It would be his squad a leader. Er, stay your purpose. Force being a, a, effective is dubious. I have reason to believe it may listen to me. I'm Dr. Arcio. I was just leading the exploration for Lear have a, a hand. Just show me your clearance. Arcio head up his lanyard and then mounted his spider up to look at. Are you clear to follow? Stay out of the way. Do what we tell you. Arcio nodded. The leader motioned his group of maybe six operatives forward down the hallway and Arcio stuck closely behind them. Sirens, footsteps, orange lights. He was heading towards the thing. I better get it erased for this, he thought. Pragmatism was a tried and true comfort while walking directly towards something like a 50 50 chance of uh, waking in up tomorrow. They reached the door. It was already open. It seems that this group was the first to arrive, though. Oizo could hear the pounding of heavy boots echoing through the empty halls from all around. The leader said something into his radio and was definitely alerting side commands to their position before passing through the portal and descending the stairs. Hey! Oizo tried to get to, in the middle of everything. Hey! What? Let me go in first when we get there. Why? It was impossible to communicate as everyone was shot down the stairs like bullets down the chamber. The clamor of their boots against metal of feeling the space between the RCO and the leader. I want to try to talk it down. If it sees gun, and it won't bite. Understood. They even tried to talk him out of walking into his chamber unarmed and unprotected. Good man. Soon they lowered her into the actual containment chamber, a huge space like an airplane hangar. However, a single cubic room at center connected to the ceiling and grab. And by poles. The former cell of SCP 106, the old man. The majority of his defenses were now inert. Once they had been once they had replaced the layer of water and electric current with arcana runes, rituals, objects of powers. However, after the impasse began, such measure, such measures began sorry to fry. It was hell to upkeep them. Several lost their lives in the process. But thankfully, at the same time they did they did so had they skip. The task for it is round the cube on cat rocks, circling from both sides to the entrance. Some saying in station at regular points along the walk, point guns at the cube like it could erupt any second. Sirens, footsteps, orange lights. I still felt his chest tighten. They finally came to the entrance. A short few steps to, up to an airlock type door. Last were the strongest measures they could come up with. Which of course didn't do shit anymore. All right, Arzio said. I have this. Stay close behind. Hey, I'm the leader here. I'll come in if you sound unlike you're flailing. Hey, it's only my head on the line. Can't you just stay out here unless it attacks or I say to come through? The man looks around, a clear peep that his authority was being questioned, but unable to pinpoint a counter argument. Fine, you will do the thing and I will come through. Thank you. I just said he didn't fully feel the gratitude. In fact, it had been extremely relieving that they it would have been extremely relieving had they grabbed him by a collar and told him to go home. No such luck. It looked like he had actually had to do the sensible thing. He walked into the doors and it put his code. Beep, the mass of things slid out of his way. Once more he walked past burnt herbs, candles, strings of crystals, a rotten horse head on a stake, another such occult paraphernalia. For the second door, another code. He took a deep breath. Fuck, 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 fuck. In, out. In and out. In and then out. Okay, go. He pressed enter. B. This door stood open. He put on smile or like nothing was wrong. Tony, you're back. Hope you weren't waiting long. It's Sarah Logan. He, he thought, though there were no eyes. But was it not actually? An ice hawk, it wasn't clear to Arceo. Under the assumption, and something resembling the 11424 was still there, Logan continued. It seems he didn't come back unaltered. 
But it's not like that has happened before. I can, I'm sure we can fix you back up, eh? I'm not Tony. Arceus' heart dropped. To whom do I... I owe the pleasure? Attacked from mouth seen and unseen, which is brown liquid spilled. Arceus barely avoided wincing as he, he saw it meet with his shoe. Whatever came through the hole, the remains of the old man, the human-shaped hole in the world. It seemed never-ending. Already its body and associated fluids had filled nearly a quarter of the of the chamber. You tell me, Logan. It was the 11-424's voice, but it wasn't. It had his intonations, his dry humor, pacing speech, but bubbled. It hissed. It popped with evil with every syllable and for or a second after he stopped seeking. And it accused. I don't know what you mean. I mean, you tell me. Who am I? D11424? Maybe. Maybe I am. Or is there a caveat there, hmm? When this all gets risen up, who, who am I? D11 and 424 2? D11 423? No, that's way too low. Oh, we've been at this a long time, Logan. Let me guess. 110? 133? That's closest to what I remember. Or does my memory even matter? The thing slithered its front closer. You tell me, Logan. Is this about the clones thing? As far as Iso could read this abomination, it might have seemed surprised at this statement. He tried to capitalize on that. Tony, I'm not here to argue philosophy. Be with you. You want the truth? We have plenty of backups of you available at all times. When you die, you come back in a new one instead of us make, remaking you and teleporting you back through magic. It was a lie because we found that makes you more complacent. But you know what isn't a lie? Your memories. We have a way to harvest memories from the dead and place them into a new body. Adding on to your collected experience. That's what you are. Your experiences do continue. They do stack up one on another. And it reports you're just D11424, Tony Marquez. Like, I know you. Come on. Is that really so hard to swallow? The thing retreated into itself. Mass folding in on mass. Lumps becoming lumpier. Pops zits and open wounds squeezed. He's by the pressure of moving and pouring fluids. But no, you're wrong. You've taken things from me. I died. Tony Marquez died in a, a diving accident. Where the fuck did you learn that? I also hit a surprise. You've died many times. What do you mean? <sighs> I mean me! The original me! Tony! Who wasn't... Tony who wasn't D-class Tony! Tony Marquez! The me who could stand a fucking chance! That Tony! You... I... I thought I was in prison. I thought I committed a felony. I can't even remember what I did or what I didn't. You fucking... You took that from me. My life. You took me from my life. You were dead, Tony. I was so surprised even himself with the yell. He had to hand it to his throat as to check if he'd really done it. He hoped the man outside didn't take that as a signal, but he neglected to look back so he wouldn't alert it. The answer of his response softer now. You were dead. That's how we make D-Class now. It was a new program when we got you. You were a guinea pig. I'm at the head of it. Some of the other guinea pigs responded poorly to the idea that weren't fully themselves. They weren't fully themselves. That's why we kept it from you for so long, Tony. We knew this response would happen. That doesn't mean you're any less real to me. I've known you for decades. You do amazing work. I mean, you know that. We put you in on the hardest missions. You know this stuff. There was no single face to which it, on which you read an expression, but the thing didn't move. It twitched, it hissed, but didn't move. After some seconds, it began to cough. What? What happened to you? At that, the front of it, where it tapered into an almost horse-sized point, began to move forward. It stared towards Arcio, whose heart leapt into his throat. 
It's 11, he thought to himself over and over. It's 11, it's 11, it's 11. He felt a, a gunk rise to his ankles, but he stood his ground, however. He couldn't help but sweat. Sorry. I guess I'm kind of horrified. Arceo, in, in spite of himself, let out a genuine chuckle. <laughs> a little bit. The thing laughed? I still laughed with it. <laughs> Alright, I guess we have some catching up to do. I think we do. I still let out a sigh of relief and felt the pressure in his chest dissipate, even as he found himself face to possible face with this continuously growing being of tar and, and miscellaneous organs. So, uh, to reiterate, what happened to you? How'd you end up like this? How does the Tony get to be so large and... I don't even have the words to describe all of this. I say, how's it happen? Tony? I should have had one of my have been eye sockets and tried to follow their gaze, right and out the way they, he came, towards the growing militia that had stood on the catwalk, aiming their rifles into the chamber. I don't want to die. You're not going to die, Isaac lied through his teeth. The thing pulled back like a cobra about to strike, the hissing gases from his orifices increasing in intensity, filling the room with the scent of death. I'm sorry about... Isaac ducked me behind the doorway. Fire! A spray of bullets entered the room through the open portals and pierced through his grimy flesh. Forcing it against the opposite wall before it pulled out of the way, it was a spray. It screamed and it coughed, mouths spewing unholy mixtures of bodily fluids, feces, urine, pus, blood, lymph, marrow. Isaac cowered against a corner of the cell. It wailed and thick red veins burst from its heaping mass of intestines like the legs of a, of a centipede, picking it up off the ground and enhancing its mobility. It made a long edge for Arceo, but that put it once again in the range of the guns, and the bullets pounded into its mass, spraying old brown viscera into the air and onto the walls. It was forced to retreat, screaming again, You fuckers! You prick-headed, backstabbing shit fuckers! Finally, there was that wide vocabulary of insults D11424 was referring to. It cut its losses and went straight through the wall. The concrete out around it made its makeshift entrance crackling and molding and falling apart before Arjo's very eyes. Just like the old man. Arjo stood up. It's Richard to the other side! Get ready for it! His warning seemed unnecessary once he heard the gunfire and the roaring of the, the thing. I am rot. I am decay. I am that which breaks. I am that which tears asunder. <sighs> as soon as Arsha heard the screams of the men, he knew he had to run for it. No longer fearing incoming gunfire from the doorway. Arceo tore through the open portal. Once outside, he looked up to see the thing attached to the cube, like a wriggling leech. Bullets peppered it while it screamed, but veins wrapped around its sides and, struck, and stuck to the cube. Using these appendages, it launched itself, jumping like an eel towards a group of soldiers along the catwalk. Their trained reactions unable to get them out of the way in time. They disappeared into the mass. A team leader with his visor up turned around to give Arceo a sour look from among the masses of soldiers. Arceo didn't want to hear it. He knew it was a stupid thing to say, but just keeps shooting. Stomachs and lugs and ungs and entrails and muscles blew out of the thing's service every time bullets pierced. It was spiles filling out of its open wounds, pouring onto the railings and catwalks and melting them in seconds. Its veins, as thick as arms, shot out of its body. It like snapping turtles or heads, latching onto the the nearest possible victims, sometimes sliding them against the wall, sometimes throwing them against the, the ground, and sometimes pulling them back towards the thing's center, losing them into pounds of fat and flesh. But it screamed. It just kept screaming as it faced towards a battalion of gunners. It slowed, shards of bone flying from its bullet wounds, until it finally turned into the wall and escaped. 
Sirens heightened their tone, and the lights turned red. I meet a protocol. All personnel evacuate immediately. Fuck no. I still approach the nearest soldier. I need your radio, sir. I need it now! Force overrode over protocol in this case, and soon ICO had turned into the side command. Do not arm the nuclear warhands. Ed, that thing has the alert frequency. You say this with what authority? ICO flares held his arms uselessly. Have you seen the thing? Pause. Roger that. ICO shoved the radio back into the soldier's shoulder and then followed the flow of traffic out of, of the containment chamber, up and towards the evacuation routes. They circled around, then got to the stairs, and as soon as they started climbing them, apparently hadn't gone far. The wall burst open and a howling mass of veins grabbed several soldiers. One twisted so that it, at their face was on the same side as their ass. The corpse was then tossed down several to produce a domino effect, soldiers falling one after over one another. Then it came, came through in full. It had a face now. Tony's face, but not at all. Logan. Before it closed the distance, Logan ducked and soldiers behind him found its skull full of lead, so that its eye sockets and mouth became one cavity. It screamed and fell back into the wall. It's after me. Eyes are huffed out. We know. Move. They pushed past the dead and dying, assigning the steps until they were in another open hallway. All screens in the facility now showed arrows pointing towards the exit, and Arceo found himself a flood in, in a sea of soldiers, pushing in toward the uh, stairs. Thankfully, because they wouldn't stop it, there were no heavy metal doors closed to keep the thing in. It was just as able to escape as they were. They ascended in blind panics. So blind, in fact, that nearly when I noticed that they were unimpeded. Screams came through corridors. Gunfire was all around. Sometimes they passed back rod holes in the walls where a thing must have come through and stepped in its grime and tire, but they made it to the elevators. For security reasons, the only ways out of the site were the elevators, so they fired all in. Soldiers and RCO hit the only e e button up. It worked to life, it clanked and vibrated, but went up. Up and up. And up. Screams faded from earshot. Gunfire calmed. The only sound was machinery and beating hearts. Up and up and up. Up and up. In, out, in, and out, in, and then out. I surrendered to breathe. And the doors opened. And I walked through a, a long, cold, concrete hallway with the red lights. And I walked through the open arc arcway. And they walked out into the sun, the outside, reality, where among the rocks and sand of the desert, a small army had gathered. Guns pointed at the entrance to the site. Helicopters hovered. Mounted guns on the back of vehicles. Isol's heads rolled. All too much to take it in. Soldiers came up to him and escorted him behind lines. Towards the rest of the researchers and doctors and personnel. But they were interrupted. Arceo heard nothing. The gunfire was too loud. His ears bled. It was all ringing. He turned around. There it was, trying to get out, trying to escape. He couldn't. It didn't stand a chance. It didn't even have a form anymore. It crawled forward as a mass of disconnected tendrils and body parts, each lashing of its veins sustaining so much damage that the thing it just came off or hung by strings. He closed his eyes and held his head. And so his ears and crouched. At some point, eventually, it stopped. His body stopped vibrating. The air became still. Icy opened his eyes, and all that remained was its outline. Its outline full of stars. Logan Icy fell suddenly cold, looking through the shapeless window in the world, and at the velvet, itty black of space. Interrupted at center by the immense stone structure of the temple. Floating, maybe drifting, its own 
impenetrable an stillness of welcome cold. I went deeper than merely skin, and from the dismal corner of, and found a dismal corner of Arceus's heart to settle and root in. No amount of shivers could shake it. Arceus stood straight up. The air was clouded with dust, sweat, and adrenaline. The death throes of a dying world were once again silenced. And at its base was a lacerated heart, being blood into nothing. End log. Now it's reviewedly related. Now it's viewedly related in material. <sighs> well, SCP-6500 and A, Heart, is resistant to the majority of time dilation and effects. Ongoing research is proving being fruitful and further lowering the heart's beat each per minute via temporal methods. Destruction or complete cessation of SCP-6500 of this heart had been definitively forbidden by order of the O5 Council due to the unknown potential effects on nat natural entropic phenomena. Project Cardiac Recipe-Ish-Ecacy is its last reported values as follows. Effect, act, rate, and change. External trends. Effected anomaly neutralized by SCP-6500. When the rate is at 0.86 x per day, its change is, is reduced by 342%. New anomaly affected by SCP-6500 when its rate is at 1.34 beats per day. Its change is by negative 120%. Way closed by SCP-6500 at 0.04 beats per day. It changes by negative 89%. Failure or deviation of thaumaturgic practice. This rate is at 18.06%. Changes by negative 50%. Anomalous ideas forgotten. When it's at 4.80 terabytes a day, it changes 48% less. Anomalous information corrupted. 80.62 petabytes per day. Negative thirty percent. Project trends: personal turnover rate seven and beats a month, eleven percent. Equipment and failure rate nine two point two a month, plus four percent. Reports of nausea eighty three a month, forty six percent. Reports of serious illness four point one a month. Minus eight percent. Hallucinations. Four eight point two a month, plus twenty four percent. Dreams. Twenty eight point nine for a month, plus sixty percent. Production of corrosive of fluids. Three hundred and twenty kilograms a day, one hundred and seventy six percent. Personnel or casualty rate. Three point two a month. Minus seventy six percent. Attempts of parasitic attachment four point eight a month plus six percent. Attempts at escape sixteen in times a month plus thirty four percent. Outliers and noble effects. The heart bridge container with its with the age of junior researcher are redacted who use a sewing security guard or to open the containment in chamber. Shortly thereafter, the heart was retired to contain without out of vent. A junior researcher or a redactor was brought in for interrogation. It was soon discovered that they were functionally dead, and despite their animation, bore no memories of the original junior researcher redacted. They have since been neutralized. The heart accelerated its heartbeat by 200% for two hours before emergency thaumaturgic measures were taken in against it. It was soon discovered that SCP 
that the heart had reduced adrenaline and instead blood for this a period of time, and the effect had been has been kept from repeating by a localized concept erasure of adrenaline from its containment cell. A corpse matching that of Dr. Arcia was discovered in the heart's containment chamber after using simultaneous failure of all the audio visual devices. Dr. Arcia was contacted shortly after to confirm his status and whereabouts. The source of the matching corpse is unknown. Dr. Arcio now reports dreams of the heart at once every three days, though this is rate is such an outlier that it has not been included among the rest of the data. A snorkel color covered in a thin layer of, uh, of heart sclerosis fluids was found in Dr. Arcio's office as Or The project has been in a massive success. SCP-6500 effects were being made are being mitigated at a cross the board with less than half the expected cost of what was previously thought possible. I cannot thank my team enough, but I am sure there will be more opportunities for gratitude because of road ahead and of us as long, and as of yet uncertain. I am, however, confident we will pull through. We have single-handedly postponed his the death of magic by at least several years, and we are looking forward to postponing it further. Nothing more I can say that I haven't said before. Godspeed, everyone. And that was the Path of the Thief. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to your channel. Tomorrow is the epilogue. The end of entropy. So until we get to that, goodbye.